Today I'm going to show you how to paint the Iron Golems from Age of Sigmar Warcry. When I first got the Age of Sigmar Warcry box in the mail, I was completely overwhelmed. This box is so full of plastic, and it was pretty exciting to open it up, but also kind of intimidating. So I thought to myself, I'm going to do exactly the opposite of what I did with the Soul Wars box set. I'm going to record all of my progress so that when people ask me later how I painted this, I can just direct them to this video. Our first step on the Warcry Express is going to be the Iron Golems, a gang of unstoppable blacksmiths who want all of their skin to turn into metal. The paint scheme that I've chosen is very similar to the official color scheme that GW has put forth, which is some reds and some golds and some silvers, I think. But instead of going directly with their box color scheme, we're going to actually lean more into the box art color scheme, which I hadn't really seen too many people try to replicate. Yeah, I'm going to try to replicate this because one of my favorite things to do in painting is gradients, and I thought it might be fun to try and copy some of the cool gradients going on in this color scheme. Because this is Warcry and everything comes in the number eight, we're gonna approach this paint scheme in eight simple steps. Assembly, basing, underpainting, airbrush glazing, painting the armor red, painting the skin, painting the gold on the armor, and some final basing details. I'll be introducing all the supplies you need as they come up in the video, but if you want a full list of everything you need, I've put it down in the description. In this step, we're going to cut out and put together the miniatures. I thought about omitting this step, but I wanted to make this tutorial accessible to everyone, so if you feel like you already know how to put together the miniatures and don't want my tips, feel free to skip ahead to the time code down below. For those of you still with me, you're gonna need the following supplies. An X-Acto knife, hobby clippers, the sprues that you need, it's these two, and the instructions. Before we go any further, I wanted to let you know that there are two models in this set which can be built in two different ways. This is the first one, which can be built as a signifier or a perfecter. And then this is the Iron Legionary, which can be built as an Iron Legionary with a hammer, I think, or an Iron Legionary with bolas. I chose to build the ones I thought looked coolest, but if you are going to play this game, um, you might want to look it up on the internet first to see which one you want it to be because it will affect the game mechanics, apparently. There are a few other figures which can be assembled in different optional ways in this set, but as far as I know, any of the other figures don't affect game mechanics. Now, using the instructions, we are going to cut out all of the pieces we need using our clippers. I try to keep the clippers very close to the piece I'm going to cut, but not flush with it, so there's a little bit of room to do some trimming afterwards. I like to cut out a few pieces at a time, and then once I have a few down on the table, I'll use my X-Acto knife to trim off some of the mold lines and little bits left over from the trimming. You can see here I'm using both sides of the blade in order to accomplish this. I use the sharp side in order to trim off the larger pieces that are stuck on there, and I use the blunt side as sort of a scraper to get rid of the mold lines. So I like to do this with every model first before gluing anything together. The first thing I do is I'll cut out all the pieces, file them, and put them into piles. Some people would say that this process is a little bit tedious and kind of boring, but I disagree. This is one of my favorite parts of the process. I find that model assembly can be a great companion to other activities, and I love to do this while I'm watching TV shows, or while I'm with other people and they're doing whatever social activity they like to do, and I can sit there and work on my dolls. Once we have all of our pieces cut out and filed, then we can start gluing them together. I like to use Tamiya extra thin plastic cement 
although you could use any sort of plastic glue of your liking. While working with plastic cement, I like to use a respirator and nitrile gloves. After checking online, I haven't really been able to find much information on how toxic this glue is, but because it has a strong vapor, I decide to use a respirator anyway, because it doesn't hurt to be cautious. If you're especially clumsy, you might even consider using protective eyewear, because if this glue splashes in your eye, well, it's just not, it wouldn't be good. Call a poison control center. You're also going to need some poster putty, also known as blue tack to stick the figures onto their bases temporarily for this process. Before we go any further, make sure you look at the instructions and double check that you are using the correct size of bases for each of these figures. Because once you glue them on, you can't unglue them. I almost used the wrong size bases for a lot of these figures because there are four different sizes uh, among these figures. So just check and double check that you are using the right ones before you glue them together. If you're not familiar with plastic cement, it's not so much a glue as it is a chemical that melts plastic. So when you put it on two pieces of plastic, it will melt them together. As far as I know, this glue only works with polystyrene, although it may work with other plastics too. When using it, I like to take a small amount and put it on the surface that's going to be bonded, and then I hold it together with the other surface until the two are stuck together. If there's a gap left afterwards, I sometimes like to put another coat on top of it to help seal the seam. Because this chemical melts plastic, it can create really nice smoothing effects over gaps in the plastic. Once the legs have been glued to the figure, I like to use a little bit of blue tack to stick them to the bases temporarily so they're easier to work with. I typically like to assemble multiple models at a time gluing a piece together on a model, setting it aside to dry, and then putting a piece on the second model, and so forth. Instead of gluing every piece together, I've decided to leave the arms off of the ogre breacher. This is going to make this figure a lot easier to paint later down the line. We will glue the individual parts of the arms together, but we'll keep the arms separate from the rest of the figure. These figures have a surprising amount of parts, and actually took me quite a while to put together but once they're together, they look really cool and I was really impressed with how they look. With assembly complete, we're ready to move on to the next step, painting. Basing. Actually, we're gonna do basing first. I've decided that I want all of my Warcry models to be based in sort of a desert wasteland region. So I want there to be pieces of masonry and dirt but no real plants around. And I'm gonna try and mimic this on the basis. In general, I'm trying to get the basis to match both the key art and the art on the game board. For the basing for these figures, we're gonna keep it very simple and just include some small rocks, bricks, sand, and another little few occasional parts that you'll see as we go along. For the bricks, I'm going to cut up pieces of the sprue that was left over into vaguely brick-shaped pieces. These are an easy bit of interest that I use a lot for basing on all kinds of different figures. I'm also going to be using some of these tiny crystals that I bought at the dollar store for some of the larger rocks on the bases. For the sand, I'm going to be using some Vallejo basing paste. It doesn't really matter which color of basing paste you use, but in this case, I had some leftover Vallejo red oxide paste. With all of our supplies prepared, we're ready to start. We're going to start by removing the figures from their bases and making sure there's no leftover blue tack. You may wonder why I even got you to put them on their bases with blue tack at all, to which I have no real response. We're going to just spread some of the, the paste onto the base, sort of like glazing a cake creating some unevenness along the way to sort of represent whatever wasteland of death you can imagine that these warriors hail from. I've never iced a cake, but I feel like this is probably close to what it would feel like. You can also see that I keep a damp paper towel on hand for removing some of the basing paste from my fingers and the spatula. Sculpting tool, whatever you want to call it. I was getting really into the cake metaphor. Because this basing paste tends to get pretty much everywhere and you really want to keep an eye on it, otherwise it'll 
just get all over you and under your fingernails and it's just really unpleasant. Once we have the base fully covered in paste, we can put the figure back on and it should be sticky enough to hold the figure in place without any glue or anything. If it's not quite sticky enough yet, you can let the base sort of dry for a while and it'll get stickier. Once our figure is on the base, we're going to use a pair of tweezers to add some pieces of debris to the base. You can see I'm being very deliberate about this and trying to figure out what will look good, what will make a good composition. The goal here is not to overload the base with materials or get rid of any of the negative space, but rather to enhance the composition of the figure that's already there and create sort of a sense of harmony between the base and the figure where the base is not overpowering the figure, which is what we want to be looking at. I often like to add pieces of debris in odd numbers because for some reason, odd numbers look more uh, natural and less mathematical to the human brain. So your eye will be less drawn to it if there's three bricks there than if there's two. At least that's what I learned in art class. For these bricks, I'm going to put a little bit of paste on top and put a third brick on top as if this was maybe at one point part of a wall or a foundation or something. I'm just having some fun here and creating a bit of interest on this base because we have quite a lot of room to play with. On some of the smaller bases, I probably wouldn't put this many bricks in one spot. Then I'm going to take two other pieces of debris, one brick and one rock, and put them on the other side of the ogre to just sort of add some balance on both sides. And with that done, I think that's probably enough detail for now on this base. You can also see that I made a little bit of a mistake here and got a little bit of basing paste on the ogre's knee protector. Oops. Looks like I'm... <laughs> But I would like to encourage you to just leave it there because if you're in the wasteland of, of death, it's really likely that you would probably get some dirt on your knee pads. So you can just leave it there. It's fine. It'll actually add some interest to your figure. Or if you wanted to, you'd probably take a wet Q-tip and wipe it off. Moving on, you can see that I have taken the liberty of putting paste on all of the bases ahead of time. This is going to let all of them dry a little bit and making them a little bit tackier and easier to work with. So here you can see I'm just going to have a little bit of fun and much like with the ogre's bases, add a little bit of debris to each of the bases. And for this model, which I believe is the leader of the unit, I've actually decided to add a little bit more interest to the base than just rocks and bricks. There were a bunch of weapons left over from the sprue from the alternate builds of these models. So I decided to clip a piece off of this little mace. I think it had a hand attached to it. So I clipped off the hand with my clippers and I decided to just bury it slightly in the base so it looks like there's a fallen weapon underneath the leader figure. Sometimes I like to do this with the leader figures or important figures in the army, adding a little bit of interest to their base because they worked hard for it and they deserve it. In a similar way, one of the alternate builds had someone holding this helmet from the Untamed Beasts. And so I clipped that one off as well. And I'm using that on the base of the Ogre Breacher because you know what? This Ogre also worked hard and deserves some extra flair on its base. Once you're satisfied with the amount of flair on everyone's base, you can move on to the next step. After waiting a full day for the bases to cure, you can move on to the next step, which is everyone's favorite step, underpainting. I've already done a full video on underpainting, which you can watch here. But to summarize, underpainting is just when you do all of this sort of pre-shading on the figure before you apply color to save time and effort afterwards. I'm not gonna go into too much detail on this step because I've already made a whole video about it that you can watch, uh, but there are a few tweaks to the underpainting for these figures that I will go into detail about. Before we do any sort of spraying, we're going to want to put on a respirator. If you're airbrushing without a respirator, 
It's just really bad for you. Don't do it. All right. Respirator on, gloves on, spray booth on, compressor on. Now we can get started. Oh yeah, but before we prime anything, I'm going to stick on the ogre's arms with a little bit of blue tack. The first step is going to be priming the figures in a one-to-one -one mixture of Vallejo airbrush thinner and Vallejo black primer. You could also use a rattle can of black primer for this step if you don't have an airbrush. Now, because we are using some warmer colors for our color palette on this project, I'm not going to be using the same colors for underpainting that I used in my underpainting video. In this video, we are going to use a base color of chocolate brown. We're then going to use Vallejo khaki, and then we are going to use pale sand as our top coat. So first we're going to apply a one-to-one -one mixture of Vallejo Airbrush Primer and Vallejo Chocolate Brown, covering almost all of the figures from the top, but we'll leave maybe just a little bit of black at the very deepest shadows. For our mid-tone, we're gonna use this nice warm color instead of a gray, and it's a khaki. We're going to spray the khaki color down on the model in a roughly 60 degree cone. This will be our mid-tone and should cover about 50% of the figure. We want it to just be catching on the topmost parts of the model. For more on this technique, again, check out my video on underpainting. As our top color, which we're going to spray in just sort of an 80 degree cone, just hitting the very top of the model, we're going to use our old friend Pale Sand. When you're done this process, your figure should look something like this. At this point, we already have a lot to work from and we could probably skip ahead to the color step if we wanted to. However, because of the specific glazing technique I'm going to encourage you to use for these models, I think it's best to do a little bit more pre-shading and a little bit more highlighting. So we are going to turn off our airbrush Take our makeup brush, and we're going to put a little bit of pale sand onto a dry palette. Dipping our makeup brush into the dried pale sand, we're going to take just a little bit of it and wipe most of it off on a paper towel. We're then going to give our figures a light dry brushing from top to bottom of pale sand. This is especially helpful for a lot of the little details on these figures like chainmail or the edges of the armor. These figures are just begging to be dry brushed. We can also use a smaller dry brush as well for the smaller details that are not gonna be picked up by the larger dry brush. Once we're satisfied with our dry brush, we can use a little bit of Nuln oil to help deepen the shadows on some of these figures. I would encourage you to get in your deep highlights now because it's gonna save you a lot of time later. Finally, we're going to use a little bit of pale sand mixed with a tiny bit of glaze medium. We're going to use this to highlight the very topmost part of the models, including things like the tops of the heads, the spikes on the armor, any little things that would catch the most light on these figures. When you're happy with how your undershading looks, and look how nice these figures take undershading, it's, all, it's amazing. This only takes a little while and you can get some really nice undershading on these figures because of their crisp details. Once we're satisfied, we can move on to the next step, which I know a lot of you have been asking me for a tutorial on, airbrush glazing. Before we start, I've noticed that our underpainting has brought out a few of the nastier mold lines on our ogre breacher's arms. So one of the things I'd like to do before proceeding to the next step is use a little bit of our plastic cement to just smooth over these mold lines. I'm just going to take a little bit of the plastic cement and smooth it over the mold lines and eventually they'll kind of melt together and those mold lines will disappear. After we let the plastic cement dry, we're ready to start our airbrush glazing. But first, as I've said before, the inspiration for this color scheme is the box art. When I first saw this wonderful piece of art, I was furious that no one was using it as a paint scheme. So I decided to make this tutorial to teach you how to incorporate these colors into your warband. 
Specifically, one of the things I wanted to capture was this nice gradient between this green and this red at the bottom. And one of the other things I thought was really cool about this art, it's kind of hard to see it, but is this these hints of green, bluish green, right there on the butt and on the, the, uh, the thighs right here. See this nice little bit of green lighting that's coming, coming from below the figures? Isn't that cool? I mean, you should just look up this piece of art on Google and you'll get a better grasp what I'm talking about. But what I'm trying to illustrate here is a concept called bounce lighting. Bounce lighting is this really cool idea that when a light shines onto a surface, like a green, green floor of a death wasteland, that green color is going to bounce back up onto the figures standing on that surface in the form of kind of shadows. You can see more of what I'm talking about here in this diagram, which illustrates it much better than I could with my words. So one of the things that I'm going to try to illustrate in this demo is how to use bounce lighting to create some really cool underlighting on our figures. So the main colors we're going to be using for this color scheme is going to be this kind of green, which I've, I'm using scurvy green from Vallejo to represent this. And then also kind of these golden yellow parts, uh, which I'm using, what am I using? Ochre, ochre brown to represent. And then I'm also using vermilion for the red parts. So those are going to be our three key colors for this color scheme. Out of those three colors, we're only going to be airbrushing the green and the gold colors. And because the gold is the lighter of the two colors, we're going to be airbrushing the gold first. When doing airbrush glazing, you're gonna to wanna to use the lighter colors first because if we put the yellow on first, then the green is absolutely going to just cover over that yellow in, in a nice way. And if we went the other way around, the yellow might not show up over top of the green, if that makes sense. So you always wanna start with your lightest color for this sort of gradient. Airbrush glazing is to regular airbrushing what hand glazing is to layering. That is to say, we're just upping the transparency of the paint, it's nothing special. So what we're going to do here is where we might usually use a one-to-one -one ratio of ochre brown and thinner medium. Instead, we're going to use more like a one-to-four ratio where there's very little of the ochre brown and there's a lot more of the thinner. This is going to create a much more transparent spray from our airbrush. Before we get too deep into this step, I also wanted to point out that you could actually do all of this with just a hand brush. You don't actually necessarily need an airbrush to do this step. And if you wanna find out how to do a two-tone glaze like this without an airbrush, you can check out my video on glazing right here. We're basically just doing the same steps in that, but with an airbrush. Moving on, we're gonna use our mixture of ochre brown and thinner to cover most of the top of the miniature in ochre brown. Also, I should mention, one of the reasons we're using ochre brown instead of a lighter yellow is because ochre brown is the darkest form of yellow that I had in my paint collection. And as we've established before, darker colors make better glazes. I'm gonna test out this mixture on a block of wood and you can sort of see how transparent it is on this block of wood. You might wanna have something similar to a block of wood to try out your colors on before you spray them on the miniature. Starting from the top, I'm gonna to cover the top of the figure in a lot of thin coats of ochre brown until it hits sort of the saturation that I'm looking for. The way I ended up doing this was I ended up giving each miniature a thin coat of ochre brown, and then I ended up going back through each miniature a second and third time to sort of make them all look about the same and to get the saturation that I was looking for. There's nothing really special about this step. You're just gonna to wanna to use your airbrush to do a bunch of thin coats of ochre yellow until you have a nice gradient from ochre yellow to sort of the cream color that's our underpainting. You can also see now why we use chocolate brown as our shade color because 
the chocolate brown and the ochre brown are mixing together in a way that kind of creates more of a gold tone because often the shadow color for gold is brown. Step two is going to be adding our bounce light color, which in this case, I've picked scurvy green. I picked scurvy green because it does look a lot like the box art, but I also picked it just because it reminded me of oxidized metal, which I thought was a cool concept that maybe some of this color is from the shadows, but some of it is just the metal kind of oxidizing. Because scurvy green is an even darker color, I've actually used even more thinner and added just a little bit of scurvy green to this glaze to keep it really nice and transparent. We're then gonna cover the entire bottom of the figure, including some of the yellow parts, with the scurvy green. This is sort of one of those things where you can use your artistic license, but generally we're gonna to wanna to cover the entire bottom of the base, and then we're kind of gonna to wanna to spray a little bit upwards to get a little bit of the scurvy green to spray up towards the yellow regions of the model. Remember, this is supposed to be sort of a shadow that's bouncing off the ground. So anywhere that you can imagine light would bounce off the ground and up onto the model is where you wanna see some of this green. I'm also not being too mathematical about this and I'm kind of just putting the green where I think it would look best on the model. The end result should look something like this. Once you're happy with your gradient, we can move on to the next step. At this step, we're going to be applying red paint to every part of the model that we think would need red paint, which is mostly the, the large surfaces on the armor. This step is going to be really familiar to those of you who've already watched my glazing video. We're even going to be using our old friend Vallejo Model Color Vermilion to do our red color paint. Much like in our glazing video, we're going to create a one-to-one -one mix of vermilion and glaze medium on our palette. But unlike that video, we're going to be a little bit naughty here and not use the wet palette. I don't recommend doing this. Using this glaze medium, we're gonna take a little bit on our brush, wipe off the excess on a paper towel, and then just start applying it to all of the large flat surfaces on the armor and anywhere else that we might wanna put red paint. During this phase, I just decided which part should be red as I went and didn't really plan it out. But one of the rules that you might wanna use is something I call the sandwich rule. The sandwich rule was discovered by Lady Madeline Sandwich in the 15th century. Simply stated, in order for a color scheme to look good, you want to sandwich colors together in alternating stripes. So for instance, if we have a gold part, we're going to want to have a red part and then another gold part. At all points in the miniature, you're going to want to avoid having two gold parts next to each other or two red parts next to each other. So using that rule, we're going to be trying to figure out which parts of this figure should be red and which parts shouldn't be red. Could you have added a third color like silver to help break up this monotony of red and yellow? Absolutely, but I wanted to challenge myself to not use metallic paints for this painting scheme and also to use as few colors as possible. On some parts of these miniatures, we might do some fun blending like I showed you how to do in my glazing video, blending parts of the red together with the green. This looks especially good on the shields, which have large surfaces which are ideal for some fun blending practice. You'll also find that there are parts of the miniature that we're going to want to imply our red, but we want to also imply our subject to our bounce shadow of green. Things like the leg, leg protectors, which we might want to be red, but have the implication that green light is bouncing up on them. So the way to do this is actually quite simple. We're just going to use one coat of glaze medium instead of two or three on these parts to sort of let it let the green part show through. We can put more red towards the top part of the armor to imply that light from the sky is shining on those parts. And then on any parts facing the ground, we can sort of keep them mostly green. Another fun thing that we can do is use our red like a wash and put a little bit of it in some of the recesses of things like the chain mail or some of the circle mail. Is there a word for that? Using the red to create these sort of deep red shadows to help vary up the armor a little bit. 
If you're nasty and gross, you could pretend that this is caked blood on the armor of your figures. I like to pretend that it's just rust and paint though. In general, we want to show the contrast between the vermilion and the scurvy green whenever possible by placing those colors next to each other. When you finish painting all of the red parts, it's going to look something like this. This is where I feel like the color scheme is really starting to come together. At this point, you have enough highlights and shadows to probably just play with your figures like this if you just want to get them right on the table immediately. However, I'm going to suggest a few extra steps to make these figures look more finished and not bad. There's a few parts on these figures where the shadows are getting kind of washed out and I think could use a little bit of help. So for a lot of these parts, I'm going to use a tiny bit of Agrax Earthshade to help them really pop. Things like the edges between the gold and red parts on the miniature and also the face holes in the helmet. Pretty much anywhere where the gold trim is intersecting with another piece, I've used a little bit, a very sparing small amount of Agrax Earthshade to help deepen the creases between those parts. Again, this step is optional. We already did your shading at the beginning, so if you feel like your shading is enough, you don't have to do this step. But I feel like the Agrax Earth Shade also helps the yellow stand out more and feel like a gold than just a yellow. This is what your figures will look like after this step. You can see that the contrast has definitely been boosted a little bit. At this point, you might want to add some flesh tones to your figures. The only figure that I think has a really cool flesh tone to begin with is the Ogre Breacher, which I think I've accidentally discovered a really cool color scheme for orcs or goblins. Actually, if you were to take this entire tutorial and get rid of the red parts, this would actually make a really good recipe for iron jaws. Anyway, you can see at this point I've wised up and gotten a proper wet palette for the rest of this tutorial. I've decided to use a few different skin tones for my iron golems. The base of each of these skin tones is chocolate brown, mahogany brown, and flat flesh. We will also be using shadow gray for both the leader figure and the ogre figure. According to the Deep Iron Jaws lore, when they get powerful enough, some of their skin starts to turn into living metal. So I wanted to try to depict this with who I think might have been around the longest, which is the leader figure and the ogre breacher. So for each of these four skin tones, I'm going to mix up a one-to-one -one glaze of each of those paints and glaze medium. After wiping off the excess, I'm going to apply these glazes over all of the parts of the figure, which are skin parts. You'll notice as we go further down the figure, we're going to do the same thing we did when glazing the armor and leave some of the green parts visible over the skin. Any of the skin that's going to be facing the sun is going to be skin color, and then any parts of the figure that is facing the ground will be green color. The figure that I'm going to be spending the most time on, skin tone wise, is the Ogre Breacher. This model has perhaps the largest surface area of skin of any of the figures, so I'm going to give a little bit of extra effort to this model because it can be kind of a showcase model for the entire unit. So in instead of covering the entire model with shadow gray, I'm going to be a bit more selective and let some of the areas of green still show through. A lot of the undertones are already established, so I'm just going to be using the shadow gray as almost like a highlight color on top of the existing ogre flash. You can spend as long as you want on this, and when you're done, it should look something like this. At this point, we're going to add a little bit of shading to all of the skin, and for most of them, except for the ones that are shadow gray, we're going to use Reichlin Flesh Shade. At this point, we're going to apply Reichlin Flesh Shade to everyone except for the figures with the shadow gray skin tone. I tend to be pretty liberal with applying this, and it's just kind of this magic shade that makes a lot of things look better. Um, so once you just, just put it on all over the skin tone and it's gonna help enrich in all of the colors and add a little bit of warmth to all of the colors. I like Reclam Flesh Shade because it adds a little bit of soft depth to all of the skin tones without adding any harsh shadows. For the figures with the shadow gray skin tone, we're going to use the shade Drakenhof Nightshade to add a little bit more shades to their skin tones. You want to be a little bit more careful with this color because it is a lot more harsh than the Reclam Flesh Shade, so you're going to be 
quite, you're going to want to be quite selective with how you apply this to the ogre and the leader model. You can see here, I'm just adding a little bit to the parts that I think need some deep shading, the creases and things like that. After I'm done, I actually decided I wanted to add a little bit of Reichland Flesh Shade to some smaller parts on the ogre, just to add some variety to the skin tone. And that's about it for the skin tones. You could, of course, add some additional highlights to the skin, but in this case, I thought that the results looked pretty good already. So I want to move on to the next step. At this point, I'm really liking how the models are looking, but I was a bit disappointed that the yellow was not looking as golden as I wanted it to. It was instead looking more like someone had painted the armor yellow. So what I'm going to do is apply just a few highlights to help it register as more of a golden tone. The color I used for highlighting most of the armor was a color that we already have on our palette, which is Vallejo Flat Flesh, which is really just a desaturated kind of light orange yellow color. I find it works really well for highlighting things like gold. So I spent an obscene amount of time highlighting all of the golden parts on these models, probably too much time. I'm going to leave it up to you how much time you want to spend on the highlights. You could spend anywhere between one hour to 10 hours gradually highlighting the golden parts to look sort of more golden. But I will, I think I probably ended up three or four hours maybe highlighting all the gold parts. Once I had the flat flesh highlights, I also applied some pale sand highlights to sort of some random parts on the armor that I thought might catch the light. I feel like adding these little bits of pale sand or any color of white can add um, that kind of metal look that you're looking for. I really feel like I could probably do an entire tutorial video on how to paint non-metallic metals, but in this case we're going to leave it at this simple highlight stage of flat flesh and then pale sand and call it a day. The final step that we're going to be doing is adding a little bit of details to the bases. It's actually quite simple. Our bases have a lot of shading already, just based on the airbrushing we've already done. But I'm going to take a small amount of Vallejo Blue Green, and I'm going to use it as a dry brush color, using a small dry brush to highlight some parts of the bases in Vallejo Blue Green. At this step, I've also taken little bits of Blue Green, and I've actually started adding little bits of um, oxidization on certain parts of the armor. This is an optional thing that you can do if you want to. I think it adds a little bit of character to some of the models. Once we're done with the blue-green, I've also added a little bit of dry brushing of shadow gray and flat flesh to different parts on the bases to add a little bit of variety in the terrain. I find whenever possible, if you're dry brushing organic terrain, you want to use multiple colors, otherwise it kind of looks a little bit stale, so the flat flesh and the shadow gray add a nice contrast between sort of more of a sandy texture and a rocky texture, I guess. With that done, our final step is going to be mixing up a mixture of scurvy green and Vallejo black to create the color we are going to use for the rims of the bases. To most people's eye, this is just going to look like a pure black color, but it actually has a little bit of scurvy green mixed in which is going to help sort of tie the whole figure together. I'm going to apply this in some fairly light coats. Uh, I think I had some glaze medium mixed in as well, so I'm going to use some fairly light coats using the edge of my brush, maybe two to three coats on each one, and then our figures are done. You could of course go further with a lot of these details, adding more rust or oxidization, highlights to the flesh, highlights to the gold, you can really go as far as you want with these figures, but I decided I'd spend enough time on these figures and I wanted to get this tutorial done, so we're going to stop here for today. I hope you enjoyed my tutorial on the iron golems. What did you think? Was it too detailed or not detailed enough? Would you like to see me paint the untamed beasts next? Or would you like to see me paint the war cry terrain? Whatever you choose, feel free to leave a comment down below and let me know what you thought. 
I'll answer as many questions and comments as I can. I'd like to extend a huge thank you to my first patrons on Patreon. I wasn't expecting to open a Patreon so early, but there was enough demand that I thought it was worth doing. If you'd like to see your name up here, or if you'd like to see an extended cut of this video with more painting footage, you can visit patreon.com slash Dana Howell. Or you can follow me on Twitter and Instagram at Dana underscore Howell. Thanks for watching, and I'll see you next time. Also, I forgot to tell you, you should probably glue your ogre's arms on. I forgot to mention that part. Okay, bye.